Now, there's a lot of concerns. Uh, probably you preachers have been bombarded by this, and sometimes it could be a pain in the neck from people. But this has been going rampantly ever since last year because of the times we're living in is kind of unique compared to all other times with all the restrictions, the pandemic and whatnot. But one of the things that you probably heard about is that there were so many uh, concerns about the microchip and then other people who've been having uh, conjectures or claiming that, uh, mm -hmm, that's what I'll say because I'm censored online, will have a microchip inside. So then some people wonder if uh, this is the mark of the beast. Well, thankfully, because we're Bible believers, we don't have to get paranoid and freak out. We know that this is not the mark of the beast. Praise the Lord. Uh, so besides people who claim it's the mark of the beast, you don't know what the mark of the beast is. That's candy stuff. That's little kid stuff, what you're getting now. You don't know what the tribulation will be like. It'd be far, far worse. However, there is no doubt, and people who read their Bible, they don't have to know a lot too much online. Just reading the Bible, there's no doubt from what you see right now is its precursors, and it is setting up one day in the future for the mark of the beast and what the Antichrist will do. So uh, there's so much concerns about the microchips, and I'm going to show you what I think, so I could be wrong again, but... This is what I think. I think that there's a real reason why Satan might want something like that to happen. And if the mark of the beast is a microchip, there's a deep reason why that I think people have not really thought about before. So this is going to be intensely interesting. I always wondered why. Why would Satan want something like that? As a matter of fact, this could probably... Uh, not the official mark of the beast, but something very close to it could even happen next year, believe it or not. So I'm going to show you, and the sources I give, up, give out will be purely from Scripture, 99% of the time. The 1% will be from uh, peer-reviewed university journals. So this is not just some kind of random blog. And I'm going to give you standard mainstream news sources as well. So this is going to be very interesting stuff. It, uh, it might blow your minds because I, it might have to do something with mind control. So from what I research, I think it might have something to do with mind control. And be, it all originates. We have to go all the way to the beginning of beginnings with the devil's intentions. So I wondered if you ever asked this question before or you never asked this question before. But it comes down to this thing. That's that question. Does Satan have a soul? Now, from what we discover in the scriptures, and it is safe to say that majority of Christian preachers, you don't even have to be a Bible believer, but majority of Christian preachers will say that he does not have a soul or that angels do have souls. So we're going to look at several passages. Look at Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. And then we'll read verse 7. Hebrews 1. And then your second hand to go to Mark 5, Hebrews 1 and Mark 5. As you know, this is going to be a Bible-believing type of Bible study. So we're going to look at so many scriptures. So uh, we, we're not going to turn to all of them. So if you do have a pen and paper, you can write them down. You, or you can choose to watch this later on and then rewind the video. But we're going to be turning to lots and lots of scriptures, and I hope that you'll get some sort of blessing. All right, uh, let's start off with Hebrews 1 and Mark 5. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1, and then we'll look at Mark chapter 5. The Bible says at verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 1, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels what? Spirits. Okay, so we do know one thing is that uh, angelic beings... That they, are, that they have spirits. Look at Mark 5. Mark 5. Mark 5. This is the same thing with devils as well. They have spirits. So that one we can agree with. Spirit. Look at Mark chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 12. I'm going to read it immediately now. The Bible says in verse 12 of Mark 5, And all the devils besought him. 
So these are devils. But notice what they're called at verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave and the unclean what? Spirits. Okay, so we can agree angelic beings or demonic beings that they are spirits. They have spirit. Now, the angelic beings, not the devils, but angelic beings, we also know this when we look at Matthew 22, two places, Matthew 22, Matthew 22, and 1 Corinthians 15. Matthew 22, and then we'll also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I want to say this, too, is that uh, you don't have to agree with everything of what I'm going to teach here tonight because this is a lot of stuff that I digged up myself. You didn't have time to dig it up for yourself. And not only that, you need the Lord to persuade you, not me, right? So that's why we are. We're an independent Baptist church. We're not tied to a pope. So you have to do the independent study and search for yourself. And that's why uh, we Bible believers, we all have our own independent mindsets, right? We all have our own convictions. Now, I believe in right doctrine and standing for right doctrine, and that's what we Bible believers do. But obviously, when you get deeper and deeper and deeper, then what's going to happen is that you're going to come up with questions and not really some hard, rock-solid truths, right? So at those points, it has to take time, prayer, discussion, and yes, there can be conflict and disagreements in between. So I want you all to understand that before we get over here, all right? So I'm not teaching this like it's some kind of hard 100% doctrine. There are some, though, that you're going to know if you're a Bible believer and you've heard these doctrines before that, oh yeah, this is something that is doctrine I know to be true. And then other stuff that are new and very theoretical, you're going to have, it's going to be theoretical. So that's what you're going to get out of this teaching. All right, so let's look at Matthew 22, verse 30. If you uh, go really deep in the Bible and then claim that uh, you know everything after going really deep, then you're full of yourself. Yeah. You're full of yourself and then you think that you know it all and that you're 100% right, everybody's wrong. Now, when you, it's normal when you go deeper and deeper into doctrine, there's going to be questions and time and yes, even something that's not 100% true, you can bet your soul on. Okay, but that's how you grow in the Bible. If you always avoid uh, studying doctrine and getting deeper into the book, then you're not going to grow more. That's the blessing of us Bible believers, and we're thankful for many men before us. A good example is Dr. Peter S. Ruckman and others. Why is that? Because they weren't afraid to go deeper into the book. And thankfully, uh, we thank God for these men of God at the past. If they didn't go deep in the book, I would have become a liberal in Berkeley a long time ago. It's because of what I learned from people like him that rescued me from a lot of heresy and wrong beliefs out there. But nowadays, churches are content. Sadly, even fundamental Baptist churches are just to content to just give you fundamentals and that's it. Well, that's the reason why these fundamentalist churches, and I have members who know these people, that, that uh, sway to Calvinist doctrine. You might say, why is that? Because the Calvinists are studying more into that book sadly, compared to the fundamentalist churches. So the fundamentalist churches, they appeal to people like John MacArthur and other Calvinists to know more doctrine. That's sad. That's very sad. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 22. All right, and then verse 30. I got to get going, all right? So angelic beings, they have something, they have what we can say bodies as well because of Matthew twenty two thirty. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay, in the resurrection, we know that we're going to be like the angels, right? Now go to 1 Corinthians 15. Your hand should already be there. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Resurrection, right? In the resurrection, we're going to be like that. All right, what does 1 Corinthians 15 say when, about us in the resurrection? Look at verse 42, 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. All right, that's our rapture it's talking about, right? 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection of the dead, verse 42. All right, the resurrection, we're going to be like the angels. What does the Bible describe that as? As verse 44, 44, it is so in a natural body. It is raised a what? Spiritual body. So they have bodies, but this is called what kind of bodies? spiritual so that's why they're called spirits because they got something unique it's something combined right here it's something combined right here so they are spiritual bodies 
But there's no mention anywhere in the Bible about these angelic beings or devils having souls. That's interesting. Only one. Look at Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Can you agree that mankind is a very unique creation from God? I, I would say it's safe to say most of you would believe that, right? Mankind is a very unique creation from God. We can agree with that one, most of us. So why is that? Because originally we were created in God's image. That's why. If it's after God's image, when Adam was created, he has body, spirit, but what else? Soul. So Genesis 1, And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc. So if mankind was unique from the angels and created with the image of God originally, then we have to ask ourselves this one. What is that unique difference? We know we're unique because we're, we were originally created in God's image. What makes us unique from the angels? It's the soul part that would make sense because there is no mention of that in the Bible for our angels and devils, but only man. And not only that, the Bible points out man is uniquely created. So look at the creation, right? Look how man was created. Look at how he was created. Look at verse 27, verse 27. So God created man, what? In his own image. Okay, remember that. When God started the process of creating Adam, okay, if you look at right here, when he started the process of creating Adam, he created it in his own image, right? That's the unique part. What made him originally in God's image? Look at Genesis 2. Look how he was created. Look at this, Genesis 2. Verse 7, verse 7, can we agree Genesis 2, 7 is talking about Genesis 1, 27 we read, when God created man. Yes, we can agree with that. Now look at that, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man, isn't it interesting how it concluded this creation? And man, what? Became a living soul. That's what's unique about him. So notice body, soul, spirit, verse 7. Is body because of the dust of the ground. Spirit because God breathed. And then man became a living soul. Soul, body, soul, spirit. That's what makes him very unique. So Hebrews 10.39. Here's another example that shows the distinction of angelic beings and us. That we do have souls and they don't have souls. Look at Hebrews 10.39. 39, Hebrews 10, 39. Jesus died to save our souls, especially those who believe, like the Bible says, right? All right, so Jesus died to save our souls. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. Now, remember is that uh, there's no mention in the Bible about angels uh, getting salvation. It's mankind getting saved, right? Now, we have to wonder why is that? You ever thought of that? Why is that, that uh, mankind is the one that gets the salvation that Jesus died for, not the angels? Ever thought about that? Look at Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the what? Soul. Soul. Wait a minute. Remember, uh, the point of salvation, it's all about the salvation of our soul being saved from hell, going to heaven. It all has to do with the soul right here, salvation. That's why angels are not mentioned about uh, getting saved because what stands to reason, they didn't, uh, they didn't need any soul to save to begin with. Look at 1 Timothy 4.10. Here's something interesting. Look at 1 Timothy 4 and compare that with James 2. This is extremely interesting. Look at the wording of the Word of God here. Look at James 2. And then uh, he, uh, 1 Timothy 4. James 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. You notice how some of these people nowadays and preachers, they'll pretend to give you something deep by going to Greek and Hebrew. You ever saw them doing that? 
that, so that they can pick 10 different definitions out of one word yeah. and then give you a new doctrine that you never heard before and you go, ooh, you, you, you just need to leave that book alone. Yeah. Leave the words of God as it says and then if you believed it literally as it says rather than having an Alexandrian mindset of making it symbolic all the time, then maybe the Lord would have spoken to you and you would have caught this. Look at uh, right here, 1 Timothy 4, verse 10. The Bible says here, uh, actually this is the, yep. Yeah. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior, right? The Savior is the person who saves. Of who? All men. So it's not the angelic beings, it's mankind. But based on what? Especially of those that believe, if they put their faith, right? So notice that uh, mankind here can put the faith, and that's why their soul can be saved right here. But look at James 2. That doesn't work with Satan or his minions. Because remember, you have to put faith so that your soul can be saved, right? Do, isn't that what the Bible says? That doesn't work with Satan. Why? Because they believe too. But they're not saved. There's a distinction there. They don't have a soul. Look at James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils, what? Also believe and tremble. There's something distinguished. They don't have a soul. That's what I see more and more. So then... If we were to think about it, Satan, okay, when we're thinking about in his demonic state or angelic state before and after the fall, there's something uh, unique about us that Satan doesn't have then. He doesn't have a soul. Now, wouldn't this explain why he hates mankind so much? Because we're so special to God more than Satan, more than the angels, which is why the Bible shows angels are our, uh, serve us at Hebrews 1. This would also make sense why the angels would choose to rebel and follow Satan. Why? Because we, we got something better that they don't have, and there's this jealousy, and there's this anger and hatred against us. We got something they don't have. We were originally created in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. It makes sense why angelic beings, intelligent as they are, wise as they are, why would they make a stupid decision like that to follow Lucifer? Unless it's jealousy, unless it's hatred, and why them and not us? Wouldn't this also uh, explain here why Satan always wants to take away our souls to hell? He doesn't care about our body as much, does he? But why does he love our souls so much? Mankind today, evil people today, all they care about is bodies, but not Satan. That's not precious to him. What's more precious to him is a soul. Isn't that very strange? Isn't that very strange? There's something about the soul. It could be it's because, why? He never had that to begin with. So then, if you're following along right here, we can agree that nothing in this universe can create a soul except God, right? No matter what, how highly advanced your technology, your science is, nothing can ever create a soul. Not even the devil. God Almighty can create a soul, though. Mm -hmm. Now think about this. Is that uh, Satan, doesn't he always want to imitate God? Yes. That's his character. That's his personality pattern. So if Satan wants to imitate God, wouldn't it stand to reason that Satan, that he would do two things. He would probably have these two thoughts in his mind. One, I want to be like God. I want to be like the Most High, Isaiah 14. But there's something he don't have that God has, a soul. So he probably wants to have a soul himself. Secondly, Satan, he always wants to imitate God. He's the grand mimicker. We all can agree with that. But he can, uh, but he can only make copies, but he can't uh, do the same thing as God. God creates things, ex nihilo, out of nothing. 
Satan always, what he does is imitate God, but it's not the same as God's creation, ex nihilo, out of nothing. No, what he does is he takes what is God's, corrupts it, twists it to imitate like himself. What's an example, Pastor? Your new international version. Did I offend some of you? He can't create his own Bible. He tried and then doesn't get famous. Bhagavad Gita and all these other uh, 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 wicked, uh, wicked books and so-called sacred scriptures never been famous compared to the Christian Bible. Not even the Quran. So what did he have to do? So he can't create his own Bible. He has to imitate it. So he takes God's and then makes it as his own. And then he creates all these false modern Bible versions. Uh, he cannot create Christianity. He cannot do what Jesus did. What did he do? He had to imitate it. Roman Catholicism. Did I offend some of you? He has to make it so Christian that the world thinks it's Christian. And today the world thinks that it is Christian. That's what Satan always does. So it stands to reason that Satan, he would like to do the same thing like God does. He can't create a soul. He can't create Christianity. He, create, he can't create a Bible. He can only make it. What does he do? He takes that original substance and then he has to use the original substance from God and contaminate it, twist it, and make it his own. And there are several cases where we do see something like that, which is interesting. One, so we're not going to look at all these verses, but think about several of these cases. If we're going to think about how Satan ever attempted throughout the beginning of Scripture all the way to the end, how he would make a soul, he can't create an ex nihilo out of nothing. He can only make. So he can take what's God's original thing and then create and then make his own, right? How can he do that? Well, maybe he could have his fallen minions come down, intermingle with mankind. How is a new soul born? It's from birth. When a baby gets born and has a soul, Satan can't do that. So Satan, what he has to do is intermingle with God's original substance here. Doesn't it make sense then at Genesis chapter 6 why God had to drown all of the world? Why? Because there's something demonic there. There are these either soulless or contaminated soul beings where they were intermingled with the sons of God and that's why giants were born. See that Genesis 6, so God had to wipe it all out. Look at Genesis 11, Genesis 11. Second time Satan tried. Tower of Babel. Look at Genesis chapter 11. Satan tried to do this again with uh, contaminated souls or create a soul again. Uh, make, excuse me, make a soul again. If sometimes I make a mistake by saying create, you'll know what I mean, all right? So basically he makes, he takes God's original copy and makes his own. So excuse me if I ever say that. One, we see the flood. He tried to do that. That didn't work. Two, Tower of Babel. Now, why the Tower of Babel? Because look at what these people said. This, look at this. Look at this, what they said. Verse 4, 11, 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto what? Heaven. Heaven. They want to go up there. Somehow connect to the gods here. Well, I think they were foolish. Well, I don't think God saw it that way because look what God said about this action of theirs. He thought that this was possible. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. And the Lord said, The people is one, and they, all, they have all one language, and this they begin to do, right? This Tower of Babel. He could have let them just go up and die up there. But he knew that there was something going on. He said that what they began to do, and now nothing will be what? Restrained from them, which they imagined to do. God realizes nothing's going to stop them unless he puts a stop to it. By the way, isn't it interesting God says that what they imagined to do, compare that with Genesis 6, when they intermingle with sons of God, what did God call that? What they've imagined to do. All that was their imagination. So they were thinking of something with these angelic beings again. Here's an example from Herodotus. Herodotus, who's an ancient historian in his famous book, The Histories, that ancient, if historians want to study ancient history, they use his work. You know what? He describes something like this. Now, the Tower of Babel, if you know, it has origins to uh, Ch uh, Chaldean origins, okay, or Sumerian origins. 
That's where the Tower of Babel is located. Look what Herodotus said about these Sumerians, uh, Chaldean people, what they thought. Quote, the temple is a square building, two furlongs each way with bronze gates, and was still in existence in my time. It has a gold central tower, okay, one furlong square with the second erected on top of it, and then a third and so on up to the eighth. All eight towers can be climbed by a spiral way running around the outside. Well, it's like a Tower of Babel then. Why are they doing this? Look at this. Uh, and about halfway up there are seats and a shelter for those who make the ascent to rest on. On the summit of the topmost tower on the top, what do they do once they get to the top? Stands a great temple with a fine large couch in it richly covered, and a golden table beside it. The shrine contains no image. Then what is it for with this nice couch? And no one spends the night there, no one spends the night there, except as the Chaldeans, who are the priests of Baal. They say this, one Assyrian woman all alone. Semiramis, Nimrod, who were responsible for the Tower of Babel, you know who, where she came from, Assyrian sources. But they put one Assyrian woman on the top of the tower there, all alone, whoever it may be that the God has chosen. They're tempting somebody to intermingle. Yes. That's why ancient history, there was, it was very infamous about temple prostitution when they worshiped these fallen angels. Or they are gods. Why is that all tied together? It has to do with Genesis 6. What caused the fallen angel to come down, remember? Yeah, it's because of mankind's women, right? They saw that they came down. That's how you conjure them up down. That's what they were doing, the Tower of Babel. Why do you think the Bible talks about high places? They always try to build up high places. And there's prostitution and idolatry. Or something going on, but they didn't have the knowledge like the Tower of Babel ha had back then that they carried from their ancestors like in Genesis 6. The Chaldeans also say, though I do not believe them, so Herodotus doesn't believe these Chaldeans, but the Chaldeans believed it. God enters the temple in person and takes his rest upon the bed. There's a similar story told by the Egyptians at Thebes where a woman always passes the night in the temple of the Theban Zeus and is forbidden, so they say, like the woman in the temple at Babylon, to have any intercourse with men. And there is yet another instance in the Lycian town, town of Patara, where the priestess who delivers the oracles, when required, is shut up in the temple during the night. That's what they were trying to do. They wanted to do what their ancestors did at Genesis 6. So they were trying to bring it down. But then what did God do? He put a stop to that. All right, let's look at the next part. Look at Jude. Jude. Here's another time that it happened. Abraham's time, it also, they tried to attempt it. Where Satan tried to create souls. What is it? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. You might say, how so? Because if you think Sodom and Gomorrah, they just had like same-sex issues, that's not what it was. It was really immoral sex issues. They did it with everything out there. Yeah. All right, that's how wicked it was. Look at Jude, verse 7. Well, let's start with verse 6 so we can go by context. Jude 1, 6 is talking about those fallen angels at Genesis 6, right? Now look at this. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Oh, see, they left their angelic state, their heavenly being. Why? To intermingle with those humans at Genesis 6. But keep reading. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So God already drowned them out with Noah's flood. We know that. But look at this. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what even as mean? That means in like manner. And no, that's not original Greek, that's plain English. Yeah. All right, look up even as, in like manner, yeah. in similitude, following the example of, that's what it means. Yeah. Right. The example of who? Those fallen beings intermingling. Mm -hmm. 
Look at, it's about intermingling here. Look at this. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. See that intermingling? Mm -hmm. And going after strange flesh are set forth for an example. See, strange flesh. Wow. Do you know what uh, flesh means? Flesh throughout the Bible means mankind. Uh, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, right? That's one example. That's referring to humans, mankind. But it says strange flesh, right? Do you know what the word strange means? And I'm not going to quote Greek here, all right? But I'll give you Greek, just a side bonus, okay? <laughs> side bonus. St uh, strange flesh in Greek means animals, believe it or not. But let's go to English. The Bible says, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, another there are another types of flesh or other flesh. Yeah. And that means animals in the, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15. Wow. You don't have to look at me like a tree full of vowels. You can read your Bible yourself, 1 Corinthians 15. It says that. <laughs> All right, there's other type of flesh. Yeah. You know what stranger means? Other, another person or another, uh, uh, other abnormal, something else. So it's not just humans right here. It's something else they mingled with. What? They were following the fallen angels. That's why God, why do you think God intervened by burning them to the ground? There's something about what they did. Look at Deuteronomy 2. Deuteronomy 2. Another time Satan tried to do something. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 20. Third is Babel. Uh, second is Babel, excuse me. Third is uh, Sodom, Abraham's time. Did it continue? Yeah, with uh, Moses through David. You might say, how so? These uh, beings survived the flood or somehow continued in some weird way. And then giants were still being born. Yeah. That uh, birth from the intermingling of the sons of God was still happening. Look at Deuteronomy 2, verse 20. Look at your King James Bible. Interestingly, it says this. That also was accounted a land of giants. See that? During Moses' time. Giants dwelt there in an old time. Look at verse 21. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the what? Lord destroyed them before them, and they what? Succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. What's it talking about? God drowned them out at Genesis 6, but then somehow the offspring continued it on and continued in their stead. See, Satan was still trying to do this thing. So uh, this offspring and this birth of these uh, wicked, uh, wicked giants coming out could be like soulless beings or some kind of fake imitation of a soul. Satan was trying to make something. Now, look... Uh, when, uh, you can write this one down. We don't have time, but 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 6 and verse 8. 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6 and verse 8. It seems to point out the giants continued in David's time, but then it mentioned that David wiped them out. So uh, it could be that the Lord, uh, he was content and he was able to wipe out what Satan tried to make, these soulless or these fake soul beings, through David. But uh, here's something interesting is that I can uh, obviously, I can obviously believe that remnants of them can still continue in other parts of the world. There are very interesting cases you see in China. Uh, even, believe it or not, uh, the Native Americans during that time in America, there are some stories and accounts which is very, very interesting. So, uh, so there could have been remnants that could have continued. But here's something uh, else to think about. Look at Matthew 10 and John 10. Matthew 10 and John 10. Now, when the Bible talks about destroy you, we know what it's talking about. We know that it's talking about uh, your soul burning in hell for eternity. Look at this one. Look at John chapter 10 and Matthew 10. Now we're going to look at Matthew 10 first. Matthew 10 first. And then we'll read verse 28. 28. And fear not them which kill the body, 
who are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and where? Hell. Okay, so then God says that when you get destroyed here, when someone tries to kill and destroy, right? That's the wording there in Matthew 10. When they try to kill or destroy you, it's referring to the soul part right here. That means going to hell. Now look at John 10. There's someone else who's trying to do that. What's he called? John 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh not. We know this is the devil. But for to steal and to look at the word to what? Kill and to destroy. That's his job, is to send you to hell. Jesus' job, I am come that they might have life. That's referring to eternal life for the soul. So this is referring to the soul here. So Satan's job is to make sure that your soul, isn't it interesting? So we know that means going to hell. But look at the wording right here. The wording right here, he wants to steal. Steal. You saw that? Satan wants to steal your soul as if he wants it. What's going on? Because maybe he doesn't have a soul himself, so he wants to keep it for himself. But at the same time, when he steals your soul, at the same time, there's something else. It's to kill and to destroy where you go to hell. So then what he wants is that nothing of yourself, because who is the real you? We know who the real you is. It's not the body. It's not the spirit. It's the soul, right? The real you is the soul. The soul... I have to write this down, that way you can follow. It has to do with free will. That's your will. That's where your mind is. That's where the emotions lie. That's why they have a thing called psychology, which means study of the soul. Some of you didn't know that, right? That's what psychology means, study of the soul. That's why they, make, they play mind games with you. So they always do that. They appeal to these things. You'll notice that uh, Clarence Larkin, other Bible-believing teachers, they'll talk about that when they discuss the soul. It's these aspects right here. Basically, that makes up the real you, all right? We know this is not the real us. This is just an outer shell. The real you is these parts that uh, control the body and make the final decisions for the body. The body can lust and do what it wants to do, but your soul can overrun it and say, no, I want to quit drinking alcohol or smoking and stuff like that. See, so that's where all the real you is. The real you is right here. It's inside. It's not this body. Okay, so then it's interesting, the wording right here. It's like as if Satan, in this verse at John 10, it's as if he wants your soul to be gone, and then he has uh, his own soul for himself. But let's look at some interesting other cases. When, uh, when we go to David when he wiped out the giants. Isn't it interesting? There's no mention of giants after that in the Bible. Remember, the giants, they were being rare, more rare, more scarce, more scarce. They're getting wiped out by the Lord. So Satan obviously can't make more souls or uh, make false uh, souls from intermingling with God's creation of human beings who have souls. He can't do that. Then how else is he going to continue that? Well, think about this. Okay, we're getting deep, so follow along one by one right here. Now, how we know your body is alive is when your soul is in it, right? Now, if uh, my body drops dead, you'll know when, uh, why it drops dead. The soul is not in there. That's what it means. The soul is basically gone, where Jesus called it kill, destroy, because it's in hell. All right? So it's distinguished. It's gone from here and it's in hell burning forever. So we know that. Uh, your free will, your personality, your real you, it's in here. So you know that uh, the body is still alive and the soul is in there. But if I go robotic and act weird, right, like some mindless control somebody, then you know the real me is not there. Uh, the real me, the soul is not there. There's something weird going on, all right? I'm getting controlled by drugs or something like that, right? So there's something uh, messing with me. 
think about it, if the soul is your free will, your personality, the real you that's inside here, what if there's a different will inside here, a different personality inside there, a different being that's inside there just controlling your body? What if Satan can do something like that? So isn't it interesting that uh, devils, devils, they seem to be more mentioned after David's time. Now, there are some examples we see in Leviticus and other places, but this is when the children of Israel really went to demon worship. It was during the time of the kings after David where they went full-fledged as a nation. All the people start to uh, worship devils. And it is a matter of fact in history, when you look at all these pagan rituals as they worship these false gods or spirits or devils, that there is demon possession. So this is what I think is that how Satan can continue his fake soulless thing is through demon possession then. That's the closest he can get to it. Let me add another thought. Isn't it interesting that uh, Elisha, who had all the power and the miracles, there's no mention of him casting out devils. But it's in Jesus' time and the apostles you get a huge ramp in cases of demon possession and then Jesus had to cast them out. See, there was a game plan change here. It wasn't intermingling, sons of God. You, you don't see that at all. You see demon possession during that time. And during the ancient times, you don't see demon possession. It was intermingling with giants. There's some. There's something going on. How about that? All right. How many of you want to go on the altar after that? Any of you under conviction about your sin and you want to repent and get right with God? <laughs> All right, then. But uh, 2 Chronicles 11.15, 2 Chronicles 11.15, we won't turn there for time's sake, but that's the passage you'll notice. That's when they really went into demon worship, devil worship. And then if they did that, then demon it's natural to think that there was demon possession or devil possession. But it was definitely plain during Jesus and the Christian church. Demon possession still continues today. Ever since Jesus' time to today, demon possession continues. The passages to prove it, you can use Matthew 4.24. So write this down, Matthew 4.24. Mark 16.17. Mark 16.17. And then we're going to turn to, now we turn to, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice in the church age, it's so dangerous. Demon possession is a dangerous thing, and you saved Christians have to be careful. Think about it. Satan, he can never have your soul because uh, your soul gets saved from hell. But he can get your body. Why? Because your body is still filled with sin. Your body is still, still filled with sin, so he can use it. So you know what it is, is that if he ever uh, demon possesses a Christian, he can't get the spiritual nature of the soul. The soul is part of a spiritual nature. It's called circumcision. It's divided. So then it's divided. The devil can't get in there. That's why when the Holy Spirit's inside you, the devil can't get in there because of that uh, spiritual nature divided. But guess what? The Holy Spirit's divided from your flesh there. See, because if he takes part of your flesh, which has sin, he's corrupted. So then there's spiritual circumcision. That's Colossians 2. Some of you have heard of that doctrine. I'm not going to go over there. But he can get a hold of your flesh. So what appeases Satan's mind is this, see? What will appease his mind is that he can possess your body, pretending as if that he owns a soul, see? So then let's say that this me right here as a safe Christian, you know, this is me with my will and then my heart and intentions and all that. But then let's say the devil possesses me and then I would say stuff, wicked, weird stuff that devils would say, like Satan did with Simon Peter, right? We saw that case, Matthew 16 and other places. So then when the devil does that, right now what you're seeing is my soul talking to you through this body. But you can't see my soul. So then it appeases the devil's mind if he was to, inside me and then he was talking to you, it's the closest he can do to imitate a soul inside. See that? So that's what appeases his mind. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. 
So that's why Christians have to be careful of this. It's possible to be demon-possessed, so you have to keep pleading the blood of Christ. Stay away from sin. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. See that? Why? The other part is separated, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See that? That spiritual nature part is separated. But nevertheless, the, the devil, he can get a hold of your body. Uh, when Dr. Upman talked about demon-possessed Christians in his teaching, he gave a good reason, like, if the devil has your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your tongue, your heart, and then the hands, the way you move and walk and act, uh, why not call it demon possession? Amen. See, he pretty much possesses your body on what you're doing. Okay, but let's look at um, uh, Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Actually, we're going to have to go to John 17. John 17, excuse me. And 2 Thessalonians 2. John 17 and 2 Thessalonians 2. Actually, my time is almost up, so I better... So I'm going to just jump ahead. q and I'll drop the time more. If any of you uh, have to... Uh, go out and take a break, use the restroom, please feel free to do that, okay? So I apologize. I didn't think it'd take this long. Let me try to wrap it up quickly. But I don't want to go too fast where it goes over your head, all right? So I'll try to take my time on it. All right. Now, before I read these passages, what, we were what I was going to show you in Matthew 4 is, so it always fascinated me. I'm like, uh, well, Satan, he can never uh, create his own soul. So I'm uh, reading through the Bible. I'm like, I wonder if there's something that was very, very close that he was very close to maybe to doing. And then when I kept studying and thinking, there are two cases. Now, the first case didn't really work out. But the second case, he really looks like he did accomplish something where he didn't really create, but he made it this time. So let me talk about the first one. The first one, all right. And you're just going to have to look at the verses yourself later on. But just food for thought, all right? Consider this food for thought, not doctrine, okay? Food for thought to think about. I always wondered why Satan wanted to tempt Jesus to eat the stones and then jump off a cliff. The third temptation, I know why, all right? He wants to receive worship. But I don't get it where he wants Jesus to eat stones, jump off a cliff. Now, you'll, when you read your Bible, you'll notice a heading over there. Uh, where this is accepted, majority of Christian preachers will agree with this one. They'll, they'll mention right here, Satan tried to get Jesus to commit suicide, right? To jump off a cliff. That's what they said. But did they really consider their statement there? So then Satan wants Jesus dead. Why? Why does he want Jesus dead? Because he will be the Messiah to save the world, maybe. So then, but maybe he could come again, I don't know. But then it got me thinking, what about the stone part then? Do you think that's also possible to consider that way, that Satan would want Jesus dead by eating a stone? You know, you try swallowing up a stone yourself when you're 40 days in the wilderness, starving and thirsty. So it seemed like to me Satan always wanted to try to kill Jesus. Why do you suppose that way? Because he did that with Herod. He always wanted Jesus to die ever since the beginning. Revelation 12 talks about the dragon Satan tried to eat the child, Jesus, right, that Mary tried to give birth to. So it seemed like right here, Satan always wanted to kill Jesus. Why? Now, this was something scary that I thought about. How devils possess your body, we know this, is that when it's empty inside. That's why you got to watch out for this uh, yoga stuff. And then the other part about uh, mind emptying and stuff like that. So then I'm like thinking... Could it be Satan wanted Jesus' body to possess? Why? So that he can be like, hi, I'm Jesus. And isn't it interesting in the future, he is going to do that. Not Jesus' real body, obviously, because it's in heaven, but he's going to act like I am Jesus. You might say, why do you think that's a good thing to think about? I think that's a good uh, thing to think about because why did Satan want the body of Moses? He was fighting with Michael the archangel for the body. There's something going on. He wanted a body for himself. What did Jesus say to God? A body hast thou prepared for me. And Satan wants to imitate God. 
wants that body for himself, maybe. That's something to think about, isn't it? So then it, that's something really... Uh, uh, Satan always wanted to be like Jesus, and he always wanted to be God. But he wanted, he wanted Jesus, the real Jesus, see, not to be in there. He wanted him to be in there. And then, hey, I'm Jesus Christ. But in Revelation 13, we know him to be the Antichrist. How about that? But uh, that didn't really work out. That's why it makes sense to me why the last temptation, he wanted Jesus to worship him. Because he can't take God's place and take Jesus' body. So he wanted to compromise. I'll get God to bow down to me. But it didn't work for him at the end either. All right, now let's look at um, uh, John 17, 12. Here's where it was really close, I'd say, is Judas Iscariot, I think. There's something about Judas's soul as if Satan made it his own. I'm not saying he did, but it's very, very close. Like he made it his own, like he finally got his own soul now. So let me give you some cases. John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Uh, those that thou gavest me, I have kept. He's talking about his disciples. And none of them is lost, but the who? Son of perdition. So we know Judas Iscariot is the son of perdition, okay? So uh, with that uh, mumbo jumbo, I don't know where to draw right here. All right. So Judas, son of perdition. Look up sop. It's interesting in your Bible, right? When Jesus gave the thing to Judas. But anyway, that's a bonus, all right? So some of you have Bible believers heard that before. But the point is right here is that Judas Iscariot, he's the son of perdition. And son of perdition we know is the Antichrist, John chapter 17, uh, no, 2 Thessalonians 2. And then notice at verse 3, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the Antichrist, the who? Son of perdition, the Antichrist. But look at this Antichrist, Revelation 13. Revelation 13, it's interesting here. Now, Satan wants to receive worship, yes? But in Revelation 13, how they worship Satan is when they worship the Antichrist. Why? Because Satan's imitating as God the Father, God the Son. The Antichrist is imitating God the Son, and then Satan is imitating God the Father. When we worship Jesus, we're worshiping God, right? Worshiping the Father as well. Look at this. When they worship the Antichrist, they're worshiping Satan as well. Jesus is God incarnate, right? That's why you hear from Christian preachers the Antichrist is Satan incarnate. Look at Revelation 13, verse 4. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Like what the Bible says, the Father gave power to the Son, right? It's, it seems imitating. And they worship the who? Beast, saying who is like unto the beast. But that's what? Satan receiving worship as well. That's Satan incarnate right there. Wait a minute. Then it looks like right here that if Judas Iscariot is the son of perdition, why is it all of a sudden then right here, because we know this, we know, and you're going to hear, uh, I'm going to say even the majority of Christian preachers uh, taught about this one, is that in the tribulation, what happens is the Antichrist is going to rule, right? But then he gets assassinated. So then when he gets assassinated, he dies. And then what happens? The, Judas Iscariot comes out from hell. That's his soul, right? Not his body, because Acts 1 says his body's all splattered on the ground. So his soul went to hell. But the soul of Judas Iscariot comes out and enters the Antichrist's dead body. Now, you've heard that before, right, in tribulation teaching, that the Antichrist will have the soul or what they call the spirit, doesn't matter, soul or spirit of Judas Iscariot inside him. We do know that is definitely the soul of Judas Iscariot because why? He's in hell, the pit, right? Acts 1, but then he comes out of the pit, Revelation 17, Revelation 11. The Antichrist comes out of the pit. The son of perdition comes out of the pit. 
and goes into uh, the body of the Antichrist. If it's the, so then, if it's the soul of Judas Iscariot, see that? That goes in the Antichrist. Why is it considered to be Satan incarnate then? There's something weird going on right here. It's as if Satan and Ju took Judas's soul. The thief came not but to steal. And then whatever was left of Judas, he was able to destroy and then make it somehow his own. There's something weird there. Now, I'm not saying that he did, but it seems to point that out right there. There's something going on. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something going on where this is pretty close to what Satan did to basically say, I now have my own soul or something. It's something close. I don't know what it is, but there's something close or something going weird going on here. Oh, it's very, very weird. Um, I do know this. Judas is not Satan because of Matthew 27 and Mark 14. Uh, Judas Iscariot, the Bible uh, said that he got convicted over his sin, but obviously he wasn't saved. So that's, Satan doesn't have that. Uh, Mark 14 points out, Jesus said it's better that this man would not have been born. So it shows that Judas Iscariot, he is his own soul. But then you get John chapter 6, where Jesus says that, have not I chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. He called him a devil. And it was based on what? Uh, the next verse of John chapter 6, when he, he said one of you is a devil, he spoke of Judas Iscariot, which should betray him. So it was at that betrayal, something happened. At the betrayal, something happened. Look at John 13. Here it is, John 13. If Satan successfully create or make his own soul somehow, there was only one way he could do that. Because remember, God is the only person who can create a soul, right? You got to realize this one. Satan could not do that with Judas Iscariot without God's permission, without God doing something right here. Look at this one. John 13, verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. When I have dipped it. So he's going to point out who's the guy who's going to betray him. And when he had dipped the, sauce, uh, dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. When he did that, look what happened. And after the sop, what? Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest too quickly. That's why Jesus said you are a devil when he betrayed him at John 6. The, the, only God, see, has the power to create a soul. There, so there's something where he did something right here, it seems like. But if that's not big enough, the tribulation, what does this have to do with microchips, Mark of the Beast, mind control, and all that? This is where you want to go to. Let's close it off. Luke 21. <laughs> Luke 21. Now, I say all this, I say all this, because I have two more hours left to teach. No, I'm just kidding. I say all this because it makes you understand what, what leads to microchip and all this kind of weird stuff. All right? Look at Luke 21. Luke 21. Now, before I give you the sources and everything as I finish it off, and we'll make Q&A short tonight, okay, because of this. Look at verse 7, all right? Luke 21, verse 7 through 9. Now, uh, just... Uh, Skim through that, read through that yourself. I don't have time to read through everything. Luke 21, 7 through 9, can we agree that's a tribulation, right? Yeah, that's a tribulation, okay? Matches with Matthew 24. Uh, if that's the tribulation, what happens at the tribulation? Verse 19, okay? Verse 19. Now, before we go there, Satan, we know this. Devils, we know that devils can possess, devils can possess the body, right? And yeah, in a sense, they can possess the spirit of a lost person. Why? Because their spirit is dead within them. That's why an unclean spirit can get in there, right? But there's no mention about a soul. They cannot possess soul. But isn't it interesting what Luke 21 warned about what you should do? You who are the real you, the soul, what you should do. Luke 21 verse 19, in your patience, what does it say? Possess ye your soul. What? Does that mean something else is going to possess our soul? 
Ah, Revelation 14. This is it right here. Look at this. This is it right here. Okay, look at this. This is interesting. Revelation 14. Hence, you hear uh, some teachings nowadays or some people, Bible believers, proposing when you get the mark of the beast, what's going to happen is it may be like a microchip and then it will control your mind. Remember, the mind is from where again? The soul. It's going to control your mind where you're not going to be the real you pretty much anymore and you'll be a mindless robot or something. Okay, where do they get this? Well, what in the world? That's La La Lulu stuff unless uh, maybe there's, they're onto something. Look at this right here. Now, the Bible says, Luke 21, that when the tribulation saint, right? Luke 21? Luke 21, tribulation saint, they have to possess the soul, right? Luke 21 calls this patience, right? Is that what it said? Yeah, this is the patience, all right? What does the Bible call the patience of the saints? Revelation 14, uh, uh, Revelation 14, 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Who what? Worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. See, I don't have to explain it for you. You're a Bible believer. You know what it means. Now let the King James Bible read for itself and then you'll find your own conclusion right there. When they avoid that mark of the beast, that's considered as their patience and they possess their soul. If they reject that mark, then they're not possessing their soul. And when they have that mark, something else is possessing their soul. Wow. Now think about this. Devil, demon possession continues on even till today. But... Satan didn't have that at Genesis 6. He had the intermingling. In the tribulation, you can still carry on demon possession then. But think about this. Genesis 6, the intermingling, we do know this. It's going to happen too at the tribulation when you look at Daniel 2. So Satan's got a double whammy here where he's close to creating some kind of making his own soul then. He's got demon possession combined with intermingling of the fallen beings. Now, this is crazy stuff when you look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Is this possible? You can get a technology like this. That such a technology is coming. Yes, there's too many sources. And I'm going, to, uh, this is from the Scientific American, uh, let's see right here. Scientific American, prestigious science news journal. It says right here, last year, ever since last year, mind reading and mind control technologies are coming. We need to figure out the ethical implications before they arrive. <laughs> There's a lot right here. Well, uh, is it uh, possible that they can have technology like this? You know, you hear about uh, this kind of stuff where insert, uh, that insert a microchip and then you hear the news media saying, well, there's no such thing. This is Columbia University from their engineering department. Title of their article, Tiny Wireless in Injectable, okay? Chips use ultrasound to monitor body processes. Yeah, and read it, yeah. How about that? Why, because this is all done, you have to understand this. When you think about the, what the Bible says, peace and safety for the benefit of people, that's how you can keep justifying this stuff. So that me, I come from liberal universities. I get that. When I read that, you know why it doesn't bother uh, me as a liberal student? I'm thinking, this is a wonderful thing because they can keep tabs on us. If I have a behavior or mood in my mind where I want to commit suicide, something else can control me and prevent me from committing suicide. Yeah, amen. You and me both, preacher. One of the guys who, you know, Carl Sanders, who, who invented the RFID microchip? You know what Carl Sanders said? He spoke out, and when he read Revelation 13, he said this. He said, I became a Christian, and I got saved when I read Revelation 13, because when I made this RFID microchip, I was thinking, I'm making the mark of the beast. Look him up. Carl Sanders, C-A-R-L. S-A-N-D-E-R-S. -E That's what he took Revelation 13 as. He knew it would happen like that. 
how Bill Gates says, I never got into microchips. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation website, my, uh, in their uh, grantee, who's part of their donations they give a lot of funds to? Microchips Biotech Incorporation. I never got in, uh, involved in stuff like that, you liar. Oh, by the way, this thing, uh, they, they're not really pulling it out for you. You type it right now in Google, you'll see it though. But then when you click on it, article don't show. Oh, they got, you know why? He's trying to cover his tracks, maybe. How about that? All right, scary. Elon Musk hopes, uh, title of the article from cbj.biz, so that's the Central Valley Journal, etc. Elon, title of their article, Elon Musk hopes to implant his Neuralink brain chips in humans next year. You know what year this, uh, this was? December 14, 2021. We're not far away from next year. Lord, come quickly. Anytime now. I'll have a blowout up there. That's fine with me, Lord. No one would mind that. How about that? Isn't that weird stuff? So Revelation 13, uh, look at what your King James Bible says. It has no error at verse 16. The modern Bible translations think this is an error. There's no way you can put a mark in. So look up nearly all modern Bible versions. I looked it up. New King James Version 2. Nearly all modern Bible versions because they think that's an error in your King James Bible. They say a mark on. Because there's no way you can put the mark of the beast in you. And you know what's so scary about that? They star Christian television years ago when they got a phone call from somebody saying, is this the mark of the beast, the microchip and stuff like that? And then the guy pulled up his modern Bible version and said, no, it says mark on. So don't worry, you can go ahead and take it. And years later, if we were to do that, it's for the benefit of science and health, blah, 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 blah. And if you think I'm exaggerating with this one, all you have to do is look up microchip and mark of the beast and look at the tons of articles from both Christian churches, Christian seminaries, and even liberal news journals and scientific organizations who deny this. They say, no, it's a, supposed to be a symbol seal. So you think that your King James Bible, you should leave it alone and let it read as it says? Look, I'm open to being a symbol and seal. I actually believe that too. But I think it's more than that. I think it's safe to just leave the King James Bible as it says, because I can't predict the future for you on what it will be. So I would leave that verse alone. That way somebody in the future who sadly misses out the rapture, when they read that, then they can get their eyes open and not get part of that, rather than get brainwashed by the stinking liberal news media and the scientific journals and even sadly Christian seminaries who are pushing that. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark where? In their right hand or in their foreheads. Let's all bow with the word of prayer tonight. God, my Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been eye-opening to uh, uh, what the devil's device is. The Bible says we are not to be ignorant of his devices. I pray that these things would make us more wary about Satan's plan and take salvation of a soul more seriously, Lord and to be able to try to win souls before things get worse and not to follow with this program of what the devil's trying to do in the last days. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.